Chapter 13 You were there? In the summer of 1955, when Marianne was seven and Audrey was one, we loaded up our old gray Ford and left Baltimore for El Paso, Texas. Demoralized by the lack of job prospects, tired of his brother's judgment and resentments, worried about his own health, Bela had contacted his cousin, Bob Ager, hoping for advice. Bob was the adopted son of Bela's great-uncle Albert, who had immigrated to Chicago with two of his brothers in the early 1900s, leaving the fourth brother, Bela's grandfather, in Presov to run the wholesaling business that Bela had inherited after the war. It was the Chicago Eggers who had supported George's immigration to America in the 1930s, and it was also they who had secured our opportunity for visas by registering the Eger family before the war. I was grateful for the generosity and foresight of the Chicago Eggers, without whom we never could have made a home in America. But when Bob, who now lived with his wife and two children in El Paso, told Bela, come west. I was worried that we might be walking into another dead end disguised as opportunity. Bob reassured us. He said the economy was booming in El Paso, that in a border town immigrants were less segregated and marginalized, that the frontier was a perfect place to start from scratch, to reinvent one's life. He even helped Bela find a job as a CPA's assistant at twice his Baltimore salary. The desert air will be good for my lungs, Bela said. We'll be able to afford to rent a house, not another tiny apartment. And so I agreed. We tried to make the upheaval into a fun adventure, a vacation. We drove scenic highways, we stopped at motels with swimming pools, and got off the road early enough in the day to have a refreshing swim before dinner. Despite my anxieties over the move, the cost of gas and motels and restaurant meals, the mile stretching once again between Magda and me, I found myself smiling more often. Not the mask of a smile worn to reassure my family. The real kind, deep in my cheeks and my eyes. I felt a new camaraderie with Bela, who taught Marianne corny jokes and bounced Audrey in the water when we swam. In El Paso, the first thing I noticed was the sky. Open, uncluttered, vast. The mountains that girded the city to the north drew my gaze too. I was always looking up. At certain times of day, the angle of the sun would flatten the range into a faint cardboard cutout, a movie set, the peaks a uniform dull brown. And then the light would shift, the mountains rainbow into pink, orange, purple, red, gold, deep blue, the range popping into relief like an accordion stretched to expose all its folds. The culture, too, had dimension. I had expected the dusty, out-of-touch frontier village of a western movie, a place with stoic, lonely men and lonelier women. But El Paso felt more European, more cosmopolitan, than Baltimore. It was bilingual. Multicultural without the stark segregation. And there was the border itself, the union of worlds. El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Chihuahua, weren't separate cities so much as two halves of the same whole. The Rio Grande cut through the middle, dividing the city between two countries, but the border was as arbitrary as it was distinct. I thought of my hometown, from Koshitsa, to Casa, to Koshitsa again, the border changing everything, the border changing nothing. My English was still basic and I didn't speak Spanish at all, but I felt less marginalized and ostracized here than I had in Baltimore, where we lived in a Jewish immigrant neighborhood, where we had expected to find shelter but instead felt exposed. In El Paso we were just part of the mix. One afternoon soon after our move, I am at the neighborhood park with Audrey when I hear a mother call to her kids in Hungarian. I watch her, this other Hungarian mother, for a few minutes, expecting to recognize her, but then I chide myself. What a naive assumption, that just because her voice is familiar, 
a mirror of my own, we might have anything in common. Yet I can't stop tracking her as she and her children play, can't let go of the feeling that I know her. Suddenly, I remember something I haven't thought of since the night of Clara's wedding, the postcard tucked into Magda's mirror in Koshitsa. The cursive script across the picture of the bridge, El Paso. How had I forgotten that ten years ago, Latsy Gladstein moved here, to this city? Latsy, the young man who was liberated with us at Gunskirchen, who was on the top of the train with Magda and me from Vienna to Prague, who held our hands in comfort, who I thought might marry Magda one day, who had come to El Paso to work in his aunt and uncle's furniture store to save for medical school. El Paso, the place I thought looked in the postcard like the end of the world, the place where I now live. Audrey pulls me out of my reverie, demanding to get on the swings. As I lift her up, the Hungarian woman approaches the swing set with her son. I speak quickly to her, in Hungarian, before I can stop myself. You're Hungarian, I say. Maybe you know an old friend of mine who came to El Paso after the war. She looks at me in that amused way that adults look at children, as though I am delightfully, impossibly naive. Who is your friend? she asks. She is playing along. Latsy Gladstein. Tears spring into her eyes. I'm his sister, she cries. She has read my code. Old friend. After the war. He's a doctor, she says. He goes by Larry Gladstone now. How can I explain the way I felt in this moment? Ten years had passed since I rode with Latsy on top of a train with other displaced survivors. In that decade, he had fulfilled his dream of becoming a doctor. Hearing this made no hope or ambition seem out of reach. He had reinvented himself in America. So could I. But that is only half the story. Standing in a park in the hot desert sun, I was indeed at the end of the world, farther in time and space than I'd ever been from the girl left for dead in a pile of bodies in a muggy forest in Austria. And yet I had never, since the war, been closer to her either, because here I was almost acknowledging her to a stranger, here I was meeting a ghost from the past in broad daylight, while my daughter demanded to go higher and higher in the swing. Maybe moving forward also meant circling back. I find Larry Gladstone in the phone book and wait a week or more before I make the call. His wife, an American, answers the phone. She takes a message, she asks several times how to spell my name. I tell myself he won't remember me. That evening, Bob and his family come over to our house for dinner. Marianne has asked me to make hamburgers, and I make them the way my mother would have, the ground beef mixed with egg and garlic and breadcrumbs, rolled up like meatballs, served with Brussels sprouts and potatoes cooked with caraway seeds. When I bring the meal to the table, Marianne rolls her eyes. Mom, she says, I meant American hamburgers. She wants flattened patties served between tasteless white buns, with greasy French fries and a puddle of bland ketchup. She is embarrassed in front of Dickie and Barbara, her American cousins. Her disapproval stings. I have done what I have promised myself never to do. I have made her feel ashamed. The phone rings and I escape the table to answer it. Edith, the man says. Mrs. Ager. This is Dr. Larry Gladstone. He speaks in English, but his voice is the same. It brings the past into my kitchen, the sting of the wind from the top of the train. I am dizzy. I am hungry, as I was then, half starved. My broken back aches. Latsy, I say, my own voice far away as though it is coming through a radio in another room. Our shared past is pervasive yet unmentionable. We meet again, he says. 
we switch to Hungarian. He tells me about his wife and her philanthropic work, their three daughters, I tell him about my children and Bela's aspirations to become a CPA. He invites me to visit his office, he welcomes my family to join his family for dinner. So begins, again, a friendship that will last the rest of our lives. When I hang up the phone, the sky is turning rose and gold. I can hear my family's voices in the dining room. Bob's son Dickie is asking his mother about me, am I really an American, why is my English so bad? My body tenses, the way it does when the past is too near. It's like a hand thrown out in front of my children when the car breaks too fast. A reflex to protect. Since my pregnancy with Mary Ann, when I defied the doctor's warning, when I chose that my life would always stand for more life, I resolved not to let the death camps cast a shadow over my children. That conviction has hardened into a single purpose, my children can't ever know. They will never picture me skeletal with hunger, dreaming of my mother's strudel under a smoke-thickened sky. It will never be an image they have to hold in their minds. I will protect them. I will spare them. But Dickie's questions remind me that while I can choose my own silence, and I can choose the kinship or camouflage of others' silence, I can't choose what other people say or do when I'm not there. What might my daughters overhear? What might others tell them despite my efforts to keep the truth locked away? To my relief, Dickie's mother moves the conversation in a new direction. She prompts Dickie and his older sister Barbara to tell Marianne about the best teachers at the school she will start in the fall. Has Bela instructed her to maintain the conspiracy of silence? Or is it something she has intuited? Is it something she does for my sake, my children's sake, her own? Later, as their family gathers at the door to leave, I hear Dickie's mother whisper to him in English, Don't ever ask Andy Ditsu about the past. It's not something we talk about. My life is a family taboo. My secret is safe. There are always two worlds. The one that I choose and the one I deny which inserts itself without my permission. In 1956, Bela passes the CPA test, earns his license, and a few months before our third child, Johnny, a son, is born, we buy a modest three-bedroom rambler on Fiesta Drive. There is nothing but desert behind the house, pink and purple ceniza blooms, red yucca flowers, the throb of rattlesnakes. Inside, we choose light-colored furnishings for the living room and the den. Over fresh papaya that Bela crosses the border to buy in the Juarez produce markets on Sunday mornings, we read the headlines. In Hungary, an uprising, Soviet tanks rolling in to quash the anti-communist rebellion. Bela is terse with the girls, his stutter edging back. It is hot, I am very pregnant. We turn on the swamp cooler and gather around the TV in the den to watch the Summer Olympics broadcast from Melbourne. We tune in just as Agnes Kelly, a Jew from Budapest on the women's gymnastics team, warms up for her floor routine. She is 35, six years older than I am. If she had grown up in Kasha, or in Budapest, we would have trained together. Pay attention. Bela tells the girls. She's Hungarian, like us. To watch Agnes Kelly take the floor is to watch my other half, my other self. The one who wasn't sent to Auschwitz. Kelly, I later find out, bought identification papers from a Christian girl in Budapest and fled to a remote village where she waited out the war, working as a maid. The one whose mother lived. The one who picked up the seam of her old life after the war, who hasn't let her hardships or her age destroy her dream. She lifts her arms, extends her body long, she is poised to begin. Bela cheers wildly. Audrey imitates him. 
Marianne studies me, how I lean, lean toward the TV. She doesn't know I was a competitive gymnast once, much less that the same war that interrupted Agnesh Kelly's life also interrupted, still intrudes on, mine. But I sense my daughter's awareness of my held breath, of the way I follow Kelly's body with my body, not just with my eyes. Bela and Marianne and Audrey applaud each flip. I am breathless when Kelly is slow and controlled, when she leans all the way down over her legs to touch the floor, and then revolves from a seated forward bend to a backward arch and up into a handstand, all grace and fluid motion. Her routine is over. Her Soviet competitor takes the floor. Because of the uprising in Hungary, the tensions between Hungarian and Soviet athletes are especially fraught. Bela boos loudly. Little Audrey, two years old, does the same. I tell them both to hush. I watch Larissa Latinina the way the judges do, the way Kelly must be watching her. I see that her high kick is maybe a little higher than Kelly's, I see the buoyancy of her flips, the way she lands in a full split. Marianne sighs with appreciation. Bela boos again. She's really good, Daddy, Marianne says. She's from a country of oppressors and bullies, Bela says. She didn't choose where she was born, I say. Bela shrugs. Try twirling like that when your country's under siege, he says. In this house we cheer for Hungarians. In the end, Kelly and Ladinina share the gold. Latinina's shoulder brushes Kelly's as they stand side by side at the award ceremony. Kelly grimaces from the pedestal. Mom, why are you crying? Marianne asks me. I'm not, I say. Deny. 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 Who am I protecting? My daughter? Or myself? Marianne grows ever more curious, and is a voracious reader. When she has read every book in the children's section of the El Paso Public Library, she begins scrambling around the bookcases in our house, reading my philosophy in literature, Bela's history. In 1957, when she is ten, she sits Bela and me down on the beige couch in the den. She stands before us like a little teacher. She opens a book that she tells us she found hidden behind the other books on one of our shelves. She points to a picture of naked, skeletal corpses piled up in a heap. What is this? she asks. I am sweating, the room spins. I could have predicted this moment would come, but it is as surprising to me, as arresting and terrifying as if I had walked into the house to discover that the live alligator pit from San Jacinto Plaza had been installed in our living room. To face the truth, to face my daughter facing the truth, is to face a beast. I run from the room. I vomit in the bathroom sink. I hear Bela telling our daughter about Hitler, about Auschwitz. I hear him say the dreaded words, your mother was there. I could crack the mirror. No. 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 I want to scream. I wasn't there. What I mean is, this isn't yours to carry. Your mother is very strong, I hear Bela tell Marianne. But you must understand that you are a survivor's daughter, you must always, always protect her. This could have been an opportunity to soothe Marianne, to unburden her from the need to worry about or pity me, to tell her how much her grandparents would have loved her, to tell her, it's all okay, we are safe now. But I can't leave the bathroom. I don't trust myself. If I say a word about the past, I will stoke the rage and the loss, I will fall into the dark, I will take her there with me. I focus on the children, on the things I can do to make all of us feel secure and accepted and happy in our new home. 
There are the daily rituals, the hallmarks of the week and seasons, the things we do for joy, the things we count on, Bela's unusual practice of shaving his bald head in the morning while he drives Audrey to school. Bela on a shopping run to the Safeway that was built in the vast desert behind our house. Inevitably, I've forgotten to add something to the list, and I call him at the store. The grocery clerks know my voice. Mr. Ager, your wife's on the phone, they call over the PA. I tend our garden, I mow the lawn, I work part-time in Bela's office. He becomes the loved and trusted accountant for all the successful immigrants in El Paso, Syrians, Mexicans, Italians, European Jews. On Saturdays he brings the kids along to meet with clients, and if I didn't already know how much Bela was adored, I would see their love for him in the affection they shower on our children. Sundays, Bela drives to Juarez to buy fresh fruit from Chewy the grocer, and then we have a big family brunch at our house, we listen to Broadway musicals albums, we sing along to the show tunes, Bela can sing without stuttering, and then we go to the YMCA for a family swim. We go to San Jacinto Plaza in downtown El Paso on Christmas Day. We don't celebrate Christmas with gifts, but the kids still write letters to Santa. We exchange practical gifts, socks and clothes, for Hanukkah, and we bring in the new year with lots of food and the Sun Carnival Parade, the Sun Queen, the high school bands, the Rotary Club men riding by on motorcycles. In spring, there are picnic outings to White Sands and Santa Fe. In the fall, back to school clothes shopping at Amen Wardy. Running my hands over the racks, I can feel the best fabrics by touch, I have a knack for finding the finest garments for the lowest price. Bela and I both have these tactile rituals, for him, choosing produce, for me, choosing clothes. We go to farms in Mexico for fall harvest, we fill ourselves with homemade tamales. Food is love. When our kids bring home good report cards, we take them for a banana split at the soda fountain behind our house. When Audrey is nine, she tries out for a year-round swimming team and becomes a competitive swimmer. By the time she is in high school, she will be training six hours a day, as I used to do in gymnastics and ballet. When Marianne is thirteen, we build an addition to our house, adding a master suite so that Marianne and Audrey and Johnny have their own rooms. We buy a piano. Marianne and Audrey both take lessons, we host chamber music concerts like my parents did when I was a girl, we have bridge parties. Bela and I join a book club hosted by Molly Shapiro, well known in El Paso for her salons, where she brings artists and intellectuals together. I take an ESL class at the University of Texas. My English finally improves enough that in 1959 I feel I can enroll as an undergraduate student. It's long been my dream to continue my education, another dream deferred, but this one now seems possible. I take my first psychology class, sit in a row of basketball players, take notes in Hungarian, ask for Bela's help writing every paper. I am 32 years old. We are happy on the outside, on the inside often too. But there is the way Bela looks at our son. He wanted a son, but he didn't expect this son. Johnny had athetoid cerebral palsy, probably caused by encephalitis before birth, and this affected his motor control. He struggled to do things Marianne and Audrey had learned to do with little fuss, dress himself, talk, use a fork or a spoon to feed himself. He looked different from them too. His eyes drooped. He drooled. Bela was critical of Johnny, impatient with his struggles. I remembered the ridicule I had faced for being cross-eyed, and I ached for my son. Bela would yell in frustration over Johnny's challenges. He yelled in check, so the children, who had picked up a little Hungarian in our home, 
despite my wish for them to speak only flawless American English, wouldn't understand the words, though of course they understood his tone. I would retreat into our bedroom. I was a master hider. In 1960, when Johnny was four, I took him to see Dr. Clark, a specialist at Johns Hopkins, who told me, your son will be whatever you make of him. John's going to do everything everyone else does, but it's going to take him longer to get there. You can push him too hard, and that will backfire, but it will also be a mistake not to push him hard enough. You need to push him to the level of his potential. I dropped out of school so that I could get Johnny to his speech therapy appointments, his occupational therapy appointments, to every kind of clinic I could think of, to every kind of specialist who might help. Audrey says now that her most vivid childhood memories aren't in the swimming pool, they're in waiting rooms. I chose not to accept that our son was forever compromised. I felt sure that he could thrive if we believed he could. But when he was young, eating with his hands, chewing with his mouth open because that was the best he could manage, Bela gazed at him with such disappointment, such sadness, I felt I had to protect my son from his father. Fear pulled a current through our comfortable lives. Once, when Audrey was ten, she had a friend over, and I walked past the open door of her room just as an ambulance raced past our house, siren wailing. I covered my head, a stubborn habit from the war, something I still do. Before I had consciously registered the siren or my reaction to it, I heard Audrey yelling to her friend, Quick, get under the bed. She threw herself on the floor and rolled under the bed skirt. Her friend laughed, followed her down, probably thinking it was a peculiar game. But I could tell that Audrey wasn't joking. She really thought sirens signaled danger. That you have to take cover. Without meaning to, without any conscious awareness, I had taught her that. What else were we unconsciously teaching our children, about safety, values, love? The night of Marianne's high school prom, she stands on our front porch in her silk dress, a beautiful orchid corsage on her wrist. As she steps off the porch with her date, Bela calls, Have a great time, honey. You know, your mother was in Auschwitz when she was your age and her parents were dead. I scream at Bela when Marianne has left. I call him bitter and cold, I tell him he had no right to ruin her joy on her special night, to ruin the vicarious pleasure I took in her joy. If he can't censor himself, I won't either. If he can't bless our daughter with happy thoughts, I tell him, then he might as well be dead. The fact that you were at Auschwitz and she's not is a happy thought, Bela defends. I want Marianne to feel glad for the life she has. Then don't poison it. I yell. Worse than Bela's comment is the fact that I never talk to Marianne about it afterward. I pretend not to notice that she is also living two lives, the one she lives for herself and the one she lives for me because I wasn't allowed to live it. In the fall of 1966, when Audrey is 12, Marianne a sophomore at Whittier College, and Johnny, 10, fulfilling Dr. Clark's prediction that with the right support, he could be physically and academically stable, I have time again to devote to my own progress. I return to school. My English is now good enough to write my papers without Bela's help, when he helped me, the best grade I got was a C, but now I earn as. I feel that I am finally getting ahead, finally transcending the limitations of my past. But once again the two worlds I've done my best to keep separate collide. I'm sitting in a lecture hall, waiting for my introductory political science class to begin when a sandy-haired man sits down behind me. You were there, weren't you? He says. There? I feel the panic start to rise. Auschwitz. You're a survivor, aren't you? I am so rattled by his question that I don't think to ask him one in return. 
What makes him think I'm a survivor? How does he know? How did he guess? I have never said a single word about my experience to anyone in my present life, not even my kids. I don't have a number tattooed on my arm. Aren't you a Holocaust survivor? He asks again. He is young, maybe twenty, roughly half my age. Something in his youth, in his earnest nature, in the kind intensity of his voice, reminds me of Eric, how we sat in a movie theater together after curfew, how he took a picture of me on the shore doing the splits, how he kissed my lips for the first time, his hands resting on the thin belt at my waist. Twenty-one years after liberation, I feel pounded by loss. The loss of Eric. The loss of our young love. The loss of the future, the vision we shared of marriage and family and activism. For the entire year of my imprisonment, for the year I somehow escaped a death that seemed mandatory and inevitable, I held to Eric's remembered verse, I'll never forget your eyes, I'll never forget your hands. Memory was my lifeline. And now? I have shut out the past. To remember is to concede to the horror again and again. But in the past, too, is Eric's voice. In the past is the love that I felt and sang in my mind all those months that I starved. I am a survivor, I say, shaking. Have you read this? He shows me a small paperback, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It sounds like a philosophy text. The author's name doesn't ring a bell. I shake my head. Frankl was at Auschwitz, the student explains. He wrote this book about it, just after the war. I think you would find it of interest, he says, offering it to me. I take the book in my hand. It is slim. It fills me with dread. Why would I willingly return to hell? even through the filter of someone else's experience. But I don't have the heart to reject this young man's gesture. I whisper a thank you and tuck the little book into my bag, where it sits all evening like a ticking bomb. I start to make dinner, I feel distracted and out of my body. I send Bela to Safeway for more garlic, and then again for more peppers. I barely taste my meal. After dinner, I quiz Johnny on his spelling words. I do the dishes. I kiss my children goodnight. Bela goes to the den to listen to Rachmaninoff and Red the Nation. My bag sits in the hall by the front door, the book still inside. Even its presence in my house is causing me discomfort. I won't read it. I don't have to. I was there. I will spare myself the pain. Sometime after midnight, my curiosity wins out over my fear. I creep into the living room, where I sit for a long time in a pool of lamplight holding the book. I begin to read. This book does not claim to be an account of facts and events but of personal experiences, experiences which millions of prisoners have suffered time and again. It is the inside story of a concentration camp, told by one of its survivors. The back of my neck prickles. He is speaking to me. He is speaking for me. How was everyday life in a concentration camp reflected in the mind of the average prisoner? He writes about the three phases of a prisoner's life, beginning with what it is like to arrive at a death camp and feel the delusion of reprieve. Yes, I remember so well how my father heard the music playing on the train platform and said this couldn't be a bad place, remember the way Mengel wagged his finger between life and death, and said, as casually as you please, you'll see your mother very soon. Then there is the second phase, learning to adapt to the impossible and inconceivable. To endure the capo's beatings, to get up no matter how cold or hungry or tired or ill to eat the soup and save the bread, to watch our own flesh disappearing, to hear everywhere that the only escape is death. Even the third phase, release and liberation, 
wasn't an end to the imprisonment, Frankel writes. It can continue in bitterness, disillusionment, a struggle for meaning and happiness. I am staring directly at the thing I have sought to hide. And as I read, I find I don't feel shut down or trapped, locked back in that place. To my surprise, I don't feel afraid. For every page I read, I want to write ten. What if telling my story could lighten its grip instead of tightening it? What if speaking about the past could heal it instead of calcify it? What if silence and denial aren't the only choices to make in the wake of catastrophic loss? I read how Frankel marches to his work site in the icy dark. The cold is harsh, the guards are brutal, the prisoners stumble. In the midst of physical pain and dehumanizing injustice, Frankel flashes on his wife's face. He sees her eyes, and his heart blooms with love in the depth of winter. He understands how a man who has nothing left in this world may still know bliss, be it only for a brief moment, in the contemplation of his beloved. My heart opens. I weep. It is my mother speaking to me from the page, from the oppressive dark of the train. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you've put in your mind. We can't choose to vanish the dark, but we can choose to kindle the light. In those pre-dawn hours in the autumn of 1966, I read this, which is at the very heart of Frankel's teaching, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Each moment is a choice. No matter how frustrating or boring or constraining or painful or oppressive our experience, we can always choose how we respond. And I finally begin to understand that I, too, have a choice. This realization will change my life.